Chapter 981 Cold War Part 1 Veilron, capital of the Griffin Kingdom, throne room. The royal court was in an uproar, torn between the reappearance of an old enemy and the never-ending strife between the ancient and the new magical households. A conflict that was only getting worse as the Ernest's and the Dyrus's factions clashed more furiously by the day. Floria taking a sabbatical despite the fact that the undead invasion was far from being resolved had added fuel to the fire. She had disobeyed her commanding officer and abandoned her duty, an unprecedented act that made the matter of closing her trial even more urgent. Lady Erna's needs to be dishonorably discharged and sentenced for her crimes. Otherwise, all those who disagree with the laws of the kingdom will follow her lead and ignore their orders out of petty grudges. Archmage Dyrus called Floria only by her family name, disregarding all of her achievements as both army officer and mage. Petty grudges? Journey echoed the words with her voice filled with contempt. Lord Dyrus forgets to mention that the laws of our kingdom guarantee Captain Erna's a speedy trial. Yet first she was suspended for months before being forced to resume duty because her country needed her skill and talent. Then she got stuck with the same workload as everyone else despite being treated as a traitor and kept in a limbo for over a year now. Now that a new equilibrium with the undead courts has been reached and the conscription is no longer needed, Captain Ernas has simply asked to either get a sabbatical or an honorable discharge. This court can't demand her to keep risking her life while all her merits and promotions are frozen. Not only does she deserve to be acquitted from all those ridiculous charges, but also a compensation for the service given and an apology for the unfair treatment she received. Acquitted over my dead body, Archmage Onia, headmistress of the Black Griffin said. Six archmages, each one a pillar of the magical community, died in Kula because of her incompetence. As the representative of the academies, I demand justice. Ready the latest stories and Enovielbend. Con. A pretentious claim since the Mephail household didn't press charges and neither did the White Griffin. Yandra's husband said. He wasn't willing to let his late wife's name be used for political plays. Enough. King Marone slammed his palm on the armrest of his golden throne. Both parties have expressed their opinion many times, and the only thing you agree on is that the trial of Captain and Mage Floria Erna's lasted too long. The Queen and I agree as well. We'll let you know our decision after carefully pondering all your arguments. His face was stern and confident, yet reality couldn't differ more. This is bad, dear. He said to the Queen via their mind link. On the one hand, Journey is right. The army has no right over her daughter now that the crisis is over. Forcing a mage to do anything without compensation sets a dangerous precedent that might lead to losing our best elements. On the other hand, Headmistress Onia is also right. The death of so many archmages cannot go unpunished. Someone has to take the blame for what happened and pay the price. I know, Silfer replied. That's why I assigned to Floria's unit only high-profile missions. Not to punish her, but because I hoped that she would achieve something so great that it would make Kula's incident pale in comparison. Something like Litha's exposing the Bright Day's ploy or revealing the threat of the Golden Griffin. We wouldn't have been able to make him an archmage if not for such outstanding results. Alas, she wasn't lucky enough and despite her accomplishments, she's not nearly in the clear. Silpha couldn't believe that if not for Kula, Floria would have already been promoted to lieutenant colonel, if not even raised to the status of great mage as well. Yet the reason you're here is to discuss the eventuality of Balkir's return. Marone said, His telepathic conversation with his wife lasted barely the blink of an eye. The king's words triggered an even bigger uproar that ended only when the queen activated one of the arrays in the room, forcing everyone to kneel and shut up. If you keep behaving like children, then I'll treat you as such, she said. As you know, 
Under the cover of the night, several youths from the most powerful magical bloodlines of the kingdom have been crippled. Their assailants maimed their bodies beyond what even Tier 5 light magic can heal. Not only were their injuries deliberately so cruel that the youths need a rejuvenator, but they were poisoned with an unknown substance that crippled their magical prowess. According to our esteemed royal healer, it will take them months, if not years, to recover. Also, this card was left on the scene of every one of the attacks. Silpha showed a simple piece of paper, bearing a single word that struck fear in the hearts of all of those present. It said, Future. The Balkia department confirmed that this is his penmanship and that the venom employed is a variant of that he used during his previous attacks. That's why we've asked you to come here. We're all survivors, and if the god of death is really back, then we must stick together. To prevent further chaos, I'll allow you to speak one at a time. Several hands were raised, and the king picked one per faction. Your majesty, with all due respect, I don't believe it's true. Archmage Dyra said. Crippling instead of killing is not how Balkir operates. On top of that, I find it suspiciously convenient that only the enemies of Archon Ernas have been targeted. Given the seriousness of his allegations, Silpha allowed Journey to reply. I understand better than anyone else the cruelty of seeing a talented youth's future destroyed for petty reasons, so I'll forgive Archmage Dyrus for his cruel words. Her voice sounded pained but compassionate. That said, I'd like to remind you that my family has been the victim of several attempts performed by unknown assailants as well, and so happened to many of my friends. Many heads nodded at Journey's words. After she had captured Kalen the Vampire and destroyed the branch of the Dawn Cord and other, the undead had spared no effort to kill both her magicless sons, Ganin and Tullian. Their detail was composed of men of the Queen's Corps and Orion's best students, while their staff was actually composed of members of Journey's Myrock household. When the most stalwart defenders and the deadliest assassins in the kingdom joined forces, only death awaited their enemies. The only reason why we have suffered no casualty is that none of our heirs is so profligate that they need to ditch their detail in order to indulge in their vices. Besides, the strategy you described is hardly a novelty. It's what the undead have done for centuries when they want to forcefully recruit someone and bend their families to their will. It's likely that Balkir is helping the courts to strengthen their position inside the kingdom. The fact that the god of death isn't capable of fighting on his own anymore is well known, just like his undying hate for all of us. The real question is why my esteemed colleagues seem more interested in pointing fingers rather than finding a cure for their heirs. Chapter 982 Cold War Part 2 The kingdom is blessed with four rejuvenators, yet none of them has been called for help. I can't help but wonder if it's because the undead courts already got what they wanted. Journey said, her words instilled the doubt that Dyrus's side might hide several snakes in the grass. The royals knew of the ongoing cold war between the Urnas and the Dyrus, yet they couldn't dismiss Journey's allegations lightly. We did call them, but they all belong to the White Griffin, Captain Urnas's academy, and they refused to help. Headmistress Onia said once the queen allowed her to speak. Mage Verhen said, Archmage Verhen. Silpha corrected Onia and raised the pressure of the array so much that the headmistress almost kissed the floor. Archmage Verhen said things I dare not to repeat in this hall. Marth and Vasta managed to restore the body of the only youth they accepted to visit, but claimed to be incapable of cleansing the venom. As for Manohar, it's Mr. Manohar to you. The mad professor corrected Onia and slammed her face on the floor with one of his constructs. Manohar. The royals rebuked him in unison. The headmistress is our honored guest and you'll treat her with the respect she deserves. Isn't that what I just did? He sounded honestly confused. By the great mother. 
Marone clenched his temples that felt as if they were about to burst open such was the headache the god of healing gave him. Why, every time I want him to be here, he's absent whereas he never misses an audience when I want him out of my hair? The king thought, this man is a curse and a blessing at the same time. Silpha replied, why did you refuse to help them? The queen asked, because even though I don't like the old hag Ernest, I like that bunch of has-beens even less. I mean, unless we go down their family tree, their latest achievement is lighting their own farts, yet they act all high and manoher. The royals cut him short. I mean, this lovely granny and I have our differences. He pointed at Journey, who couldn't get angry since Ganin had given her grandchildren for a few years now. But we respect each other, whereas I don't even know those guys. I've got no obligation to help them, unless your majesty orders me otherwise, of course. The god of healing gave the royals a small bow, hoping for the best. With each order the royals gave him, one of his escapades would be pardoned. After clearing five branches of the undead courts and chasing night out of the kingdom, Manoher only needed a couple of pardons to get out of hot waters. Not yet. The Balkia department and all academies are studying the new venom as we speak. They only need some time and luck to figure it out. Silpha shook her head, making the nobles groan. Manoher had recently returned. Giving him the means to safely run away again was a terrible idea. I'd like to point out that, even though Archon Ernas is right about the undead courts crippling youths to discipline their families and about how it was due to the victim's stupidity that the attacks were successful, some of the witnesses claim to have seen a diminutive figure dressed in black escape from the crime scene. Duke Nuragor said once the king gave him permission to speak. He was Kalyan's father, and his grudge towards the Ernas ran deep. The duke was already planning his son's marriage with Floria when he had received the news that she had not only ended their relationship, but also humiliated Kalyan in front of the royals. Are you suggesting that I did it? Journey was outraged at the accusation. The assailant worked alone, was short, and your world-renowned needles would match the puncture wounds that crippled those poor youths. So yes, the thought that you might want to get even with us crossed my mind more than once. The duke said, that's impossible. The king said while sweeping the air with his arm to firmly reject such an idea. Archon Ernest works around the clock and is rarely alone. There are plenty of witnesses who can confirm where she was during most of the attacks. More than once she was here, to update us about the latest developments of her investigations. The king's words put no one at ease, they only made Journey appear as an even more fearsome opponent to her enemies and allies alike. They were certain that she was behind the attack and that she had left on purpose enough clues to be recognized. Except for the royals, all those present believed that she was sending a message that said, If you destroy my daughter's career, I'll destroy your children's lives and with them the future of your households. Everyone knew how hard it was to replace a magically talented heir who was also a good ruler for their lands. Velandiris was the living proof of how three generations of hard work could easily crumble. After seeing how even the mad professor had sided with her, the members of the royal courts believed that in order to achieve her revenge, Journey had agreed to work with Balkier. Vischt and Velbin. CM for new updates. The members of the undead courts, instead, after she had systematically destroyed their branches in the Griffin Kingdom, exposed the identities of their elders who had remained hidden for centuries before her arrival, and slain several of their champions, believed that Balkier worked for Journey. Blood Desert, Forgotten Plume Tribe, a few weeks ago, right after Manoher was done with his task and had accepted Orion's offer for help. After almost losing at the Black Knight's hand and seeing how versatile hard light constructs were, Ilium Balkia now diligently practiced light mastery, creation, and chaos magic every day. Manoher might be insane, but he was right about one thing. 
If Knight decided to remain and fight after losing her host, if not for her wounded pride and her obsession with me, she might have easily finished me off. I was too weak to defend myself even against her crystal form. To master higher tiers of chaos magic and keep my creations from crumbling after a few minutes, I need to deepen my understanding of light magic. He thought, thanks to all the years spent studying both undead and abominations, there was little bulkier ignored about the darkness element. Just like Lith, he had discovered the art of shaping light through his studies about darkness. The two disciplines were tightly interconnected and at high levels, they shared many more similarities than the average mage would ever think. Most people believed that each element had its opposite, whereas Balkia knew how wrong they were. All the six elemental energies were able to coexist in both the world energy and the mana all things on Mogur possessed. There was no conflict, only a harmony that had to be upset to trigger their destructive abilities. It was a mystery so deep that none of the Guardians had accepted to teach him, and to the study of which he devoted every minute that he didn't spend with Ligain to study the monster abomination hybrids or with his family. I'm sorry to bother you, dear, but you have guests. Again, Eos Balkier, Ilium's wife, pulled the curtain of his tent open, letting sunlight illuminate her husband's lap. Chapter 983 Blood Judgment Part 1 Balkia worked in complete darkness so that he would be able to study the smallest imperfections in his constructs and how his state of mind affected their properties. Eos was a lovely woman in her mid-thirties, about 1.62 meters, 5 feet 2 inches, tall, with shoulder-length dark brown hair and deep brown eyes. The white linen dress she wore emphasized her bronze skin typical of the people of the desert. Damn merchants. I spent a lifetime lying low and they ruined it in a matter of seconds. I swear, the next time they come here I'm going to. First, I don't think the merchants are at fault. They are loyal to Overlord Solark and they wouldn't spread your secret like that. Eos cut him short. Second, it's the same guy from the last time, but he brought a lady friend along. Friend. Balkia was flabbergasted as he was incredulous. Someone like Minoher has no friends, let alone a girlfriend. Bring me to them, dear. Minoher and Journey were quietly waiting in the middle of the village, surrounded by armed guards ready to attack the moment the intruders attempted something funny. They weren't actually a threat to their unwanted guests, but Journey respected their bravery and loyalty. Unlike Minoher, who always wore his professor robe, Journey was covered from head to toe by one of the characteristic traveler's outfits of the desert that left only her hands and eyes exposed. The turban hid her blonde hair, a shawl covered her face, and makeup made her skin look bronze. There was no way to hide her sapphire blue eyes that drawn much attention since they were a rarity for Southerners. Balkia looked at them with life vision and was impressed by the fact that the newcomer was as magically weak as her equipment was outstanding. He led them to a tent where they could speak privately, offering them seats and hot tea while waiting for an explanation. I won't mince words with you. Journey removed her headgear, revealing her foreign origin. I don't like you, nor did I forget all the tragedies you've put me through, yet I can't condemn your methods. If I had your talents, in your shoes I would have done much worse. I don't care what you think. Tell me why you are here and how you convinced Minoher to bring you along. The odd relationship between the two had piqued Balkier's curiosity. Minoher had yet to crack any stupid joke, say something inappropriate, or act as if he owned the place. On the contrary, he was sitting straight while drinking his tea, opening his mouth only to say please and thank you to Eos. Balkier could barely recognize the god of healing in the man in front of him, which made him wonder what kind of person could succeed where even Solark had failed during their previous meeting. FNDD of I'm here because our interests align. You have a vendetta against the Griffin Kingdom's upper echelons, and so do I. 
My enemies have no qualms using underhanded tricks to get what they want and to make matters worse. They have the law on their side, which leaves me with few options and not at liberty to be picky with my allies. As for Manohar, I must thank you for showing him the importance of good equipment. He doesn't want to suffer any more defeats, Dash. The word defeat made Manohar choke on his tea, and I need his help to make sure my plan goes without a hitch. A plan that requires your assistance as well. Journey then explained what her intentions were and how she planned to use the ongoing war with the undead as a cover for her operation. Balkia was a smart man. No matter what lie she could come up with, he would understand the truth the moment her plan got into motion. Let me get this straight. Balkia said, You want to exploit me and the undead courts for your agenda, pinning the blame on us to keep your social standing. Why should I help you and why do you need a crippling rather than a killing venom? Because I know the details of your deal with Overlord Salark. You can't set foot or even send a minion inside the kingdom borders, yet it doesn't prevent you from helping a third party. I'm offering you the chance to borrow my knife and make those idiots tremble at your name again. As for the killing, it would mean giving them an easy way out. Every member of the court has lost enough people to learn how to deal with grief. If I were to kill their heirs, they would simply pass the title on the next in line of succession. Crippling them, instead, means giving my enemies hope. To make them waste time and resources in the search of a cure while sowing discord at the same time. Journey took a pause, letting Balkier figure out the rest on his own. You want to split each household into two factions. One that wants to cure the current heir and the other that wants to replace them. A brilliant plan indeed. He said. Two. She laughed. You're an optimist. The more candidates a household has, the more factions will form. Each one of them will seek external help to further their own agenda, leaving their households open to betrayal. At some point, they will be so busy dealing with their internal conflict to be incapable of keeping an eye on me. That's the moment when I'll strike. I'll expose their plots and crimes against each other, making their households implode. Yet all of my planning is just hot air unless you give me the means to turn it into reality. Balkia looked into Eos's eyes, hearing her silent plea to refuse the deal. His wife was a sweet woman and a mother. She couldn't even fathom how could Journey be so cruel to innocent children just to avenge her own daughter. Eos had tried for years to convince her husband to let go of his grudge. She understood that some things couldn't be forgotten, let alone forgiven. All she wished for was that her husband could finally make peace with his past and focus on what they had built together. If you want my help, then you'll have to accept my conditions. I'm not really interested in new magical bloodlines. Those who I really hate are part to the so-called ancient households. I want you to add the following names to your hit list. Balkia handed Journey a piece of paper containing several names. Most of them belonged to those who had sided with Dyrus to stop the rise of the Urnas. Some of them had remained neutral, or she had never heard about them, and a few were her allies. Deal. Journey offered him her hand, and Balkir shook it. This list is actually a huge help. By giving those people special attention, Balkir will be the most plausible suspect. Alienating some of my allies is an acceptable risk. In battle, collateral damage is unavoidable. After the matter with Foria is resolved, I can ask the royals to have Minoher cure them. It will strengthen the loyalty in our ranks and cause even more despair to our enemies. She thought. After returning home, Journey didn't share that part of her plan with anyone but her cousin Dida Myrock. They were so similar that sometimes she acted as Journey's body double and Dida's combat prowess matched her own. Chapter 980, Four Blood Judgment Part 2 Journey gave her cousin the special paper with Balkier's calligraphy, the hit list, and the venom, trusting her judgment about when and how to strike. The less Journey knew, the more natural her reaction would be when she received reports of the attacks and the lack of an alibi from time to time was the small flaw her cover needed to be perfect. Valeron, 
capital of the Griffin Kingdom, throne room, present day. This isn't the first time I hear such wild accusations. Journey's voice was indignant. Yet this never before someone dared to throw them in my face right in front of my peers and the royals themselves. Duke Nuragor has slandered my name and I demand justice. I invoke the right of blood judgment. If not for the array sealing the mouths and the limbs of those present, the room would have gone into an uproar. The blood judgment was an ancient ritual dating back when the Griffin Kingdom had been first unified and most feudal lords needed a way to settle grudges with their neighbors without causing a civil war. Valeron, the first king, had forbidden nobles to have armies of their own, yet they were still entitled to have personal guards. Each side would appoint a champion that would fight until the first blood was shed or the opponent surrendered. The ritual forbade the use of any kind of magic, even chore magic and artifacts. It allowed households who lacked the talent or the money to have a powerful mage among their ranks to defend themselves and also to avoid casualties. To avoid one challenge triggering another, Valeron had decreed that killing the opponent resulted in a defeat and that to issue a blood judgment, the offended party had to provide solid evidence of the damage suffered. The entirety of the court had witnessed the events, putting both the king and Duke Nuragor in a bad spot. The king wanted to keep things from escalating further while the duke had no desire to put so much at risk. Losing a blood judgment meant not only to be forced to publicly apologize to the winner, but also to be banned from all kind of social events for a year and pay half of the household's annual income as compensation. Becoming a social pariah would cause the loser to remain out of the loop and to be cut out of the major business enterprises. It would cripple both the loser's wealth and influence in the long run. On top of that, the crown would pay the penalty up front so that the defeated party would not be indebted to the winner, but to the royals. Not paying a gambling debt would worst-case scenario incur reproach, whereas not paying what was akin to taxes meant having their assets seized. Your f right stories on slash o slash v lb end. CM. Valeron had devised blood judgment to be as unpleasant as possible, so that no one would invoke it without a very good reason. The deeper the pockets of a noble were, the less inclined they would be to put their wealth at stake on a whim. Archon Ernas, the Nuragor and Ernas households are valuable assets for the kingdom. The duke's family recently gave us a great mage. I'm sure he's willing to apologize for his rudeness, if you are willing to reconsider the challenge. Marone glared at Nuragor while trying to solve the issue peacefully. Duke Nuragor had no desire to ask for Journey's forgiveness, and he wasn't scared of losing some money. He was scared of losing a shitload of money. To add insult to injury, the ritual required that the loser had to kneel. Between the blow both his wallet and his reputation would take in the case of defeat, he couldn't afford to gamble several generations of hard work out of something as trivial as pride. The Ernest's situation was completely different. Even if they lost, Journey would still be an Archon, or Ion would still be one of the best royal forge masters, and none of their children's careers would be hindered. Aside from being the heir of House Ernest, Ganin had no career while Tullian was the black sheep of the family. Floria was already ruined, Freya was just a lowly mercenary, and Quilla was an assistant professor. If someone like Minoher could still retain his spot after committing countless crimes and social blunders, the academic world wouldn't so much as raise an eyebrow at something like a lost blood judgment as long as she produced results. Kalion, instead, was both the heir and the only mage of the Nuragor household. Becoming a social pariah would cripple his chances for a good marriage, while losing the money would force him to put his magical career on hold. To not share his merits with anyone, Kalion worked for no institution and used for his missions mercenary groups that accepted a non-disclosure agreement in exchange for a hefty sum. This strategy had allowed him to quickly rack merits, 
but it also made Kalyan dependent on the family wealth to found both his magical research and the jobs he carried out for the association. Words are cheap, your majesty. Journey replied before the duke could swallow his pride and apologize. Accepting hollow apologies after being publicly accused of assault and murder would be like admitting he's right. The words of a powerful man have weight, hence they should also have consequences. Since I'm the offended party, I will also be the Ernest's champion. Do you have the guts to stand your ground on your own as well, dear Duke? Duke Nuragor cursed his big mouth one last time and started to think about how to exploit Archon Ernest's bravado. Demanding the blood judgment to take place now and revealing the identity of her champion would be a perfect move in a bard's tale, but this is reality. Rightful anger gives her no special ability, and she's still a middle-aged short woman. Without the magical marvels her husband provides her, Journey is not even half the fighter she usually is. Maybe this is actually a blessing in disguise. With all the money I'll get from her grand duchy and Dyrus's support, my lands will develop dramatically. He thought, Your Majesty, I'm ill-fit and prepared for this unexpected challenge. Duke Nuragor said, I'm forced to ask your help to contact my chosen champion, Lord Ifram Irhine. Journey flinched hearing that name. It belonged to one of her husband's deputies who had quit the Knight's Guard because his love for money outclassed that for his own country. He was a young, talented man that after turning mercenary had achieved many great feats and racked lots of merits that he had converted into the title of Baron with its attached lands. Once the king accepted, it took a few seconds for Lord Irhine to step through a gate and minutes to define the terms of his deal with Duke Nuragor. Journey used that time to get changed and study her opponent. Ifram Irhine was a man in his late twenties, about 1.9 meters, 6 feet 3 inches tall, with military short pitch black hair and ice blue eyes. Having enrolled in the army at 16, he had nearly 15 years of battle experience and his body was still at its prime. Every muscle of his body was well-toned and trained with the discipline Orion had ingrained in his daily routine. Journey was now wearing a black tank top and a pair of light blue pants. Being barely 1.52 meters, 5 foot, tall, Journey looked incredibly small and frail in comparison with the newcomer. Chapter 985 Struggle for Power Part 1 once I would have been forced to wear a goddamn shirt with the risk of my sleeves getting grabbed. This thing with calls a sports bra is really useful. Journey appreciated her tank top while fixing her blonde hair into a small bun. The skin-tight combat gear emphasized her hourglass figure, making even her opponent swallow a few times. Journey's diminutive stature made her curves stand out and her husband wish he could murder everyone in the room. You both know the rules. King Marone conjured the first blood array that would paralyze those within its premises the moment one of them bled. The victory belongs to the person who manages the injure the opponent first or pins them to the ground. Fight fairly and remember that the honor of your households is at stake. Begin. Both contestants assumed a combat stance, but didn't move from their respective starting point. Journey was wary of Irhane's long limbs and him of her counters. I'm sorry to meet you under such circumstances, Lady Ernest. I always respected both you and your husband. Irhine said while shifting his body weight in several feints without taking a single step. Sweet words coming from someone who sided with our enemies. Journey, instead, remained still as the surface of a lake. No one ever ever got rich being nice. Irhine shrugged, using the motion to hide the change of his stance that would otherwise signal his strategy. On paper, Journey was an easy mark. Shorter, lighter, older, and with slower reflexes than him. All Irhine needed to do was to hit her once while making sure she wouldn't scratch him with her nails. He was aware of Journey's craftiness and how the rules of the challenge gave her an edge he couldn't afford to overlook. Irhind focused on her shoulders to anticipate the movement of Journey's arms and with it her footwork. 
A veteran-like journey would always prepare both her attack and defense before moving, something that Eierhein could use as a road map to victory. Yet she remained motionless while he charged forward, keeping her guard neutral as if she was focusing solely on the defense. Slow. Journey sidestepped the split second before his arms reached her own, using the momentum to spin faster and kick Eierhein's left calf with all of her strength. Unlike other kinds of kicks, hits on the calf instantly caused great amounts of damage and pain, making even a man as big as Eierhein stumble during his charge and sending him to slam against the barrier that separated the fighters from the spectators. Clumsy. While Eierhein was forced to use his hands to not hit the barrier headfirst, risking a nosebleed, and his left leg was still partially numb, Journey kicked his calf again in the exact same spot, forcing him to kneel. Unprepared. She struck at the back of Eierhain's head with a knife hand, severing his spine and leaving him paralyzed from the neck down. Eierhain fell onto the ground like a stringless puppet, screaming at the top of his lungs in fear. He felt no pain, but he was perfectly aware that unless a rejuvenator cured him, that kind of injury might require months of therapy to heal. Maybe no one ever got rich being nice, but you should have known that biting my husband's hand and now mine would have consequences. Journey ignored his screams and stood at the center of the array in defiance. Anyone else? She looked at her opponents in the eyes, making sure that they got the second part of her message that said, If you come at me hiding behind the law... I'll use it to my advantage to crush you. Lord Eierhein, the fight isn't over unless you bleed or surrender. The queen replied to the man's plea for help the only way she could. His body was broken yet intact and Journey had ceased her attack, leaving Eierhein only one way to end the duel. I healed. Now someone heals me. Seeing an adult man groveling in the dirt while crying in despair was a hard sight to behold. Journey left the array the moment it started to fade and brushed against Archmage Dyrus on her way to the changing room. Nuragor is done for. You're next. Her voice was a soft whisper in his ear, yet it would haunt his sleep for a long time. Village of Lusha, Solus's tower, a week after Lith had returned from Jambel. Solus achieving a deep cyan core had caused her tower form to grow bigger, larger, and had added two new floors instead of just one. The second underground floor, located directly below Litha's labs, contained what in the future would be his personal crystal mines. Being the closest floor to the energy flux coming from the mana geyser, the tower's basement was the perfect environment to grow crystal veins. The tower walls were naturally capable of condensing and focusing the world energy, which would allow the magical gemstones to grow at an accelerated rate. Unfortunately for Lith, it would still take over a century to grow something he could actually use. The realization disappointed him, but it also provided him with an unexpected and priceless source to boost his scarce resources. After studying how the artificial crystal mine worked, Lith had planted inside the walls the purple raw crystal he had taken from the orc shaman and all the weaker and smaller gemstones he had found during his travels. The mines had a small effect on already cut crystals whereas raw ones would both keep growing as if they had never been mined and hasten the nucleation process of new crystals that would branch out those already formed. On top of that, Unlike a natural mine, the floor was perfectly insulated from external energy sources, making it safe for Lith and Solus to practice their magic without the risk of unstable crystals exploding. Since the mana geyser was also required to keep the tower form and fuel Lith's experiments, Solus was able to regulate the flow of world energy according to their schedule. Whenever we are studying or resting, I can channel everything into the mind to accelerate the crystal's growth rate, but whenever we forge master something or I'm not in the tower form, the process stops. Solus said while they were checking the development of old and new crystals. It's still better than anything I could hope for. Lith replied, 
A normal mine would require specialized workers, around-the-clock security, and be kept a secret to not have it seized by the kingdom. This way, instead, we've got our own portable mine. On top of that, its ability to refine all crystals we own has not to be underestimated. The orc's crystal is so big and pure that, given time, it might easily become white. Also, not only does the mine allow us to further refine even already cut crystals, but also to recharge and enhance red, orange, and yellow gemstones that would otherwise be disposable. Visit and Velbin. CM for E Wevels. To not waste a single ounce of world energy, Lith had bought lots of yellow crystals and filled the tower walls with them. Yellow crystals were powerful but relatively cheap because they were the highest tier of crystals incapable of self recharging. Lith hoped that using already formed gemstones as a foundation would help the mine to develop faster and provide him with valuable resources within an acceptable time frame. Chapter 986 Struggle for Power Part 2 After they were done checking the mines, Solus blinked them to the second floor of the tower to continue their work. Just like its underground twin, the new floor was as powerful as it was demanding. Lith and Solus called it the heart, and they had spent quite some time deciding how to use the room to its fullest. The heart was the tower's control panel for its arrays. Being part of Solus's innate abilities, both Lith and she could switch the magical formations on and off with a thought, giving them a powerful tool against whoever tried to attack them inside their home. The problem was that because of Solus's regression due to spending centuries without an owner, all the arrays Mina Dion had imprinted into the tower were gone. Moreover, the tower was far from being completely restored, which limited the number of arrays that could be stored inside the heart. Activating a magical formation already imprinted required but a split second, whereas replacing one array with another more suitable with the task at hand required to cast it from scratch. Luckily, your ability to turn the tower invisible and to hide underground are not related to arrays, so we have all four slots open. Lith said, Since arrays don't discriminate between friends or foes, we have to choose carefully. I'd set both Silverwing's hexagram and the darkness blocking arrays for defense. Agreed. Solus nodded as her skinwalker armor kept shapeshifting between her favorite day dresses. The hexagram is mana expensive, but it's the only array we have full control over, allowing us to hinder only our enemies. The only issue with it is that the hexagram requires our focus and will drain most of the energy from the mana geyser whenever we face a powerful opponent, making it impossible for us to warp or use it in combination with other arrays. As for the darkness blocking array, it will also block dimensional magic and protect us from chaos magic. If we meet again one of those monster abomination hybrids, we can't risk them destroying with a couple of spells the years of hard work we spent restoring the tower. That said, we can't win any battle just by defending and running away from an enemy who discovered my real nature must be a last resort. We need arrays capable of attacking without turning us into a crisp. The heart could even store impossible arrays, but none of those Lith knew were suitable for their purpose. The mirror hall already revealed all kinds of magical devices and formations better than any array could, while the tower warp made all mass transportation arrays obsolete. Will you stop that? You're giving me a headache. Lith grumbled as Solus changed her dress once again. You wear your skinwalker armor ever since you graduated from the academy, but this is my very first personal relic and one you made for me at that. I can only wear the armor while we are inside the tower, so can't you cut me some slack? Solus replied. Now that they were off duty, Lith and Solus spent a lot of time inside the tower, where she could take her physical form. No longer limited by time and space, Solus was developing her personality while experiencing what life had to offer her. Visched and Velbend. CM for new updates. Even the smallest things filled her with joy and wonder. 
Unfortunately, her naive enthusiasm annoyed Lith, who considered any delay on his timetable like a personal offense. The prolonged cohabitation and conflicting personalities made them bicker quite a lot. Look, I get that you're happy, but we still have to complete the heart before being able to relax. Becoming an archmage forced our non-awakened enemies to take one step back, but the council doesn't care about fancy titles. Until our apprenticeship begins, we're just a rogue awakened who royally pissed off a lot of people by killing several potential heirs and causing their master's downfall. Lith snarled. Fine. Then since we lack any decent means of offense, we'll use the remaining two slots for the immortal body array and the air blocking array. The former will allow me to heal you and replenish your life force akin to invigoration even during battle, while the latter will prevent our enemies from flying in or out. Solas snarled back. Now that we're done, will you please calm down? I'm sick and tired of your grumbling. It's been years since we enjoyed such a long peace and were able to spend time with our friends. Lith sighed making his favorite armchair appear behind him before plunging rather than sitting on it. You don't understand how serious this is. Lith pinched his nose and closed his eyes as he tried to keep the edge out of his voice. Our apprenticeship should have already started, which means that something went wrong. To make matters worse, Floria is about to awaken and our studies about how to make someone who is this close to a blue mana core survive the process are inconclusive at best. I'm tired of watching my back all the time and being forced to wait for the damn moment when I can finally exchange notes with Faluol about every topic. Yet until the damn council stands in my way, I'll be stuck here in Lusha. There was no point in traveling around just to be forced to drop everything and come back the moment the Hydra contacted him. Stop worrying and think about the bright side. Solus embraced him, trying to cheer Lith up. During this time, we taught Tista a lot of things. You practiced with your origin flames, and Naurand is teaching us the basics of light mastery. Lith groaned at her words. Now that he was unemployed, he had expected to have a lot of free time, whereas he had never been so busy. Teaching about advanced true magic to Tista and the three kings of the Tron Woods was a full-time job while Origin Flames drained a lot of strength that not even Invigoration could restore. Moreover, between taking care of the kids and helping protect her with the new house, Naurand could give Lith only the crumbs of his time. Last, but not least, his parents expected him to have lunch with them while Camilla to find him home when she returned from work. Not having to worry about Lith risking his life on a daily basis and being able to spend time with him every day made her happier than she had ever been. Why are you groaning? We would have worked more only if you went into seclusion. We've studied the tower mines, discovering things that probably even Mina Dion ignored. We've reforged our skinwalker armor using our twin forge technique, strengthened your house's arrays, and I'm the one who teaches our disciples while your practice origin flames until you are forced to rest to not injure your life force. Don't get me started with all our runesmithing experiments and I could go on for hours. Solas said. Fine, I stand corrected. Let's take a walk. I need your help picking something nice for Camilla's birthday. Lith got up from his chair and walked out of the tower. The building was now over 30 meters, 100 feet, high, yet it took it a second to shrink to the size of a marble before slipping on Litha's finger. Chapter 987 Boss Monster Part 1 That day, Lith and Solus were alone because Celia and his parents were out choosing the furniture for the Huntress' new house, Protector was on a mission for Faluol, and Camilla was helping Journey with a matter of the utmost importance that would keep her from returning home for a while. Lith was supposed to be happy since he could spend the day as he saw best, but he was actually incredibly bored. The reason for his bad mood wasn't his family, quite the contrary. It was the lack of company and distractions that forced him to admit that his magical knowledge had hit a wall that he couldn't overcome alone. Lith had already checked the tower's surroundings with the sentries and knew there wasn't anyone around. 
Instead of warping to his destination like usual, he could afford to take a stroll back home to calm his nerves. More than the council's meddling, it was the lack of a purpose that was eating at him from the inside. All of his lives, he had always had a goal, something to strive for, whereas now he felt like he was stuck in a limbo. He reached his personal secret clearing in the Tron Woods and sat on a rock, letting the familiar scenery soothe his grumpy mood. This was our first training ground, back when we had no idea you could turn into a tower. Lith thought, yeah, we have a lot of memories connected to this place. Here I explain to you the difference between true and fake magic. You fought Erda to the death. Tista learned how to swim in the river. Three-dimensional doors opened, cutting Solas short. You're a hard man to find, Lithverhen. A stunning young woman said while her associates moved to Litha's sides, trapping him inside a triangle formation. She was about 1.76 meters, 5 feet 9 inches tall, with wheat blonde hair and clear blue eyes. Everything in her figure from her fair skin to her curves bordered on perfection, reminding Lith of Tista. At a first glance, she seemed to be in her early twenties, but if she was an awakened, appearances were bound to be deceiving. The other two were handsome young men, both taller and bullier than Lith. Their perfect physique coupled with the focused expression that Lith associated with a true mage silently weaving their spells left little space for guesses. Either one of my human enemies recruits solely stern-looking top models as their goons, or these guys are awakened. Lith thought, unless you're here to tell me that the council has given Faluel its consent to make me her apprentice, you'd better scram. I'm in a bad mood today, and three jackasses invading my turf make it even worse. Lith was happy for the distraction. He could use some human-shaped stress balls to vent out a bit. Solus, how tough are these guys? Despite his bloodlust, he kept a level head and checked his opponent's level before doing anything rash. Your intuition is right. They are all awakened. The woman has a deep blue core, while the men have a bright cyan mana core. Their physical strength is simply unbelievable. They are on par with Trias. Solus's thoughts were filled with shock and incredulity. She clearly had a hard time believing her own mystical senses. Lith inwardly cursed his bad luck and sprang into action. He remembered Trias all too well. The youth from the Blood Desert had merged with the Black Star, a living legacy that had bestowed upon him the physical prowess of a real dragon. Even if the three youths had mana cores weaker than his own, Lith knew he couldn't afford to underestimate them. In the past, he had defeated several opponents stronger than himself with teamwork or cunning, so there was no reason they couldn't do the same. To make matters worse, his enemies had not only the numerical advantage, but also access to insanely powerful relics that put them on Trias's level. How dare you threaten the emissaries of the sea? Scylla Jernoff froze in surprise seeing Lith charging at her and then sneered at his arrogance. She was the strongest mage in the group, while the other two had been sent to physically restrain Lith in the case he resisted his arrest. Scylla would have gladly done everything on her own, but not even awakening could overcome the natural gap in strength between men and women if they had the same level of body refinement. Don't worry, Solus. Even though we are outnumbered, we are not outmatched. We are both much stronger than back when we defeated Trias, and now we even have war on our side. Lith slammed his fists together, making Solus assume her arm protector form. Your favorite ovals at n slash ovel slash bin. Gong. It covered his right arm from the hand to the shoulder, with one of the deep cyan gemstones embedded on the back of his hand while a green crystal rested on both his elbow and shoulder. A second stone glove covered his left hand and forearm, bearing the second cyan gemstone. The more Solus regained her strength, the bigger her physical form became, allowing her to turn into a more complex defensive artifact. 
War appeared in Litha's left hand with a burst of emerald flames, screeching its fury the moment the blood sheath that shrouded its senses shattered. The three awakened could feel a cold shiver running down their spines, yet they conquered their fear and activated all the mystical protections that their masters had bestowed upon them. Lith lunged forward, forcing Scylla to move right in front of his fist. The moment she blocks my right cross, I'll pivot on her guard to move behind her and use the momentum for. Litha's multi-layered attack plan crumbled when Scylla failed to move a muscle. His fist connected with her face, breaking her nose, jaw, and sending her flying outside the clearing like a living meteor. The awakened woman bounced against a few thick centuries-old trees before stopping. Lith was still trying to make sense of the events when the two other awakened unleashed several tier three spells against him. Seriously? Lith asked Solus while he used War's World Mirror enchantment to redirect the incoming attacks so that the red-haired guy's spells would hit the brown-haired one and vice versa. I never said they were as strong as Trius after he fused with the Black Star. She laughed her ass off at his amazement. You added that part yourself. I just didn't bother to correct your mistake. The spells cut deep into the youth's enchanted armor, but they were too weak to deal lethal damage. The red-haired guy executed an overhead strike with an enchanted mace that broke into pieces when clashing against war. The angry blade shattered the weapon without losing speed and then cut through the youth's armor, almost severing his right arm from the shoulder. Why did you do that? Lith used the gushing blood to reform the scabbard and put war away. It made no sense to waste its power on weaklings. Because you always fight terrifying monsters. Seeing you wipe the floor with some regular guys for once is refreshing. It's also the perfect occasion to check how strong you have become compared to awakened with a master. Solus replied while playing in his head the boss theme of Ultimate Fantasy 77. Chapter 988 Boss Monster Part 2 Am I supposed to be the hero or the boss? Lith asked. Depends. Do you feel like a hero? Solus thought. Hick. No. Then there's your answer. The brown-haired guy saw Lith unarmed and stored his weapon in his own dimensional item as well, believing that the rogue awakened was challenging him to a duel. Also, he didn't want to give Lith a reason to destroy his prized weapon. The youth performed a series of feints before hitting Lith with a left hook that carried all of his weight plus the strength from twisting his joints from the toes to the wrist. Lith ignored the feints and took the punch without moving. The impact made his head turn left, producing the sound of cracking bones and sinews. This is just sad. Lith checked the inside of his cheek for injuries, finding none. The awakened, instead, was whimpering in pain while holding his hand that was broken in multiple points. I'll mark that as a, like a boss, on your personal file. Solus giggled. Aside from some minor enemies he faced during his journeys, Lith had become used to expect the worst from his opponents. Be them Urdu, the Talons, Nalier, or even Trias and the six awakened he had faced in Zansha, Lith always found himself against the cream of the crop. Opponents that outmatched him in experience, equipment, or who had been trained by the best masters Mogur had to offer. All of his previous enemies had been professional magical swordsmen, whereas now he faced people who were just average. They weren't ancient monsters like Thrud, nor fused with powerful artifacts like Trias or Akala. They lacked even the motivation of the six awakened that on top of training daily until they sweated blood, they had been willing to sacrifice part of their lifespan to achieve their master's legacy. Good gods. I sent Scylla and her suitors to fetch for Hen in the hope she would gain some valuable battle experience and maybe learn a bit of humility. I never expected that she wouldn't last a single hit. Now I understand why you two hold him in high regard. Jiza Jernoff, Scylla's great-great-aunt and an elder in the human council said while looking at her niece's embarrassing performance. Both a thumb and Faluol, respectively the human and beast lord of the Distar Marquis, 
had a hard time not laughing out loud. Jiza was taking her fiasco with dignity. There was no reason to rub salt in her wounds. Get the latest CH jurors on N slash Belbend. Kong. Well, Jiza, maybe you should have remembered how I obtained my position before throwing the poor Scylla in the dragon's maw. A thumb Soranaut was a woman in her mid-twenties, about 1.75, 5 feet 9 inches, meters tall with raven black hair that reached the small of her back. She was wearing a comfortable mage robe that Rago had gifted her to celebrate achieving a territory at an age when most awakened were still apprentices. The heavily enchanted clothes were loose enough to not impede her movements, but could do very little to hide her soft curves. Just like Lith, she was a self-awakened who had a blue core and had still to learn about the hurdle necessary to overcome its boundaries. That's exactly the reason why I sent her. Jiza shook her head. Scylla is a bright and talented mage, but because of our blood tie, she never puts any effort in her training. I'm recording everything to both provide the council's elders with the evidence they need and to teach our youngsters a lesson. Gods. Verhen is right. This is just pathetic. We better move. Thaluel blinked right on time to save the two Awakens' lives. Lith had snapped their necks and windpipes to make sure they died slow enough to serve their purpose, but had no way to recover. Okay, princess. Tell me why you're here, and maybe I'll make this painless. Litha's words terrified Scylla as his hand clutching her throat and keeping her lifted from the ground tightened its grip. She didn't like either Orton or Kanto, but seeing their life force fading away was too much. They had tagged along to hit on her, or at least make a good impression on her aunt. She felt responsible for their demise. Let her go. Thaluel said while restoring the two men before their mana cores started to fade. Why would I? Lith made Scylla's neck crackle like wood. They invaded my turf and threatened me. They're still alive only because I let them. No, this is my turf and you're my guest. Thaluel's voice became stern, letting Lith treat and speak to her as a peer while they were in the privacy of her lair was one thing, but doing the same in presence of witnesses was quite another. An apprentice who disrespected his master was a sign of weakness that neither of them could afford to show. I'm sorry, Master Faluel. Lith let the girl go abruptly, making her fall but first on the ground while he gave the Hydra a deep bow. Our turf and our guest you mean. A thumb appeared along with Jiza. Until the council takes a decision, Awaken Verhen is unaffiliated to any faction. Elder Jernoff, Explanations are in order, if you please. After making sure that Scylla was all right, Jiza Jernoff didn't deign her niece of a second glance. She focused all of her attention on the anomaly that the beasts and humans faction were fighting over whereas the undead pressed for his elimination. Awaken Verhen, your several achievements and breaches of the Council's law have been brought to our attention. Jiza said, I've been tasked with taking you into custody and bringing you to the council's headquarters for questioning. Are you willing to follow me, or do we need to waste more time with pointless fights? Solace. Lith thought. Bright violet core, a physical prowess that dwarves all emperor beasts we've met who didn't weigh at least a ton, and she has more artifacts than decorations on a Christmas tree. She replied, Please make way. Lith gave her a small bow. Jiza Jernoff was a woman 583 years old, but due to awakening, she looked like she was barely in her early 40s. She was 1.62 meters, 5 feet 4 inches, tall with shoulder-length blonde hair streaked brown all over and light blue eyes. If not for her ample mage robe instead of the army uniform and her slightly older looks, she would remind Lith of Journey. Both of them showed emotions only if they decided so, and they were much more dangerous than their small builds would lead to believe. Not so fast. First, I have to assess your threat level. Please, remove all the cloaking devices in your possession along with any item you don't want to expose to my breathing technique. 
feel free to remain naked. I doubt you have anything I haven't already seen in my long life. Jiza sounded polite and monotone like an answering machine. Lith kept his skinwalker armor on and stored everything else inside his pocket dimension. He doubted that it was anything new for an awakened forge master, and his paranoia didn't allow him to remain defenseless. What about my dimensional items? Solus couldn't be stored because she was a living being and he couldn't risk Jiza discovering about her existence. Lord Athung and Lord Faluel are here to witness that everything goes according to protocol and to offer you assistance. Take your pick and remember that every choice has consequences. Elder Jernoff said, Chapter 989 Miracles and Madness Part 1 The moment Lith took Solus's ring off, his life force and mana flow returned to normal. A dimensional device capable of cloaking? Remarkable. Jiza nodded while walking around Lith. Her gaze made him feel like a purebred dog being examined for a competition. Let me guess, your life force has been damaged in some crazy experiment, but that didn't hinder your body refinement. You must have self-awakened for over 10 years now minimum, and you have a blue mana core, correct? Jiza had yet to even come close, but her estimates were all on point. How did you know? Lith almost expected her to discover his hybrid nature as well. Experience, child. I bet that right now you see me just as a big lump of energy. She replied as Lith entrusted his ring to Faluel. Now extend your hand and don't try anything funny. I like you already, but I will not hesitate to kill you if I need to. Jiza spoke with such a casual tone that it triggered Litha's survival instinct. Note to self, check if this woman is related to the Myrock household. Lith thought, had you given the ring to a thung in the hope of garnering the human council's favor since you're already friends with the beasts, I would have been disappointed. Jiza explained as she used invigoration to study every nook and cranny of Litha's body. Only suckups pretend to ignore that no relationship can be built without mutual trust. We don't know you, and we have done nothing to deserve your loyalty. Your choice proves that you are grateful and respectful for the good received. That, or you are a schemer son of a bitch. She took a long look at Lith, wondering which one of the options was more likely. You awakened very young, trained very hard, yet you didn't make any rookie mistake and lived right under our nose for years. Which means that despite your young age, you can't be underestimated. Put them on, please. A pair of metal handcuff with a purple mana crystal the size of a nut on each bracelet appeared in her hands. Wait a minute, this is ODI magic. Lith recognized the enchantment the moment he examined the artifact with invigoration. Its design was modern, it used runes, and required much less magical power, but the pseudo-core was roughly the same. Kid, the council existed before the three great countries were founded and will exist even after the Guardians will get bored with them and let them rot. If you get excited by a pair of handcuffs, you'll die of a heart attack when we arrive at our destination. Lith ignored her and looked straight at Faluel. Yes, it's really necessary. The Hydra said, They will lock onto your life force's signature and prevent you from channeling any form of magic. Breathing techniques included. The council upgraded them nicely. Lith hesitated for a while, during which Jiza didn't so much as blink. The moment Lith wore them, an ugly feeling spread from his wrists and coursed through his entire body. He felt as if a huge burden had been placed on his shoulders and he had to look at the world through tinted glasses. Only then did Jiza blink again and opened a warp steps leading to the council's headquarters. She pushed Lith, making him step through it first while she kept her hand on his back to control his every movement. The four awakened appeared in the middle of a courtroom with only a dock and a long rectangular table where five ancient beings that Lith assumed to be his judges sat. There was no space for the jury, but plenty of stands for spectators. Lith instinctively tried to use life vision, but nothing happened. Well, the good news is that these things deactivated death vision as well. 
The bad news is that this doesn't bode well. At all. He thought while recognizing some of those present. Off with the head. A voice that Lith had hoped to never hear again said, Objection. This is not even a death penalty case. Faluel was flabbergasted by such outrageous demand, and so was everyone but the judges. Objection sustained. Raga Dririan, the human representative of the council, was seconds away from destroying the physical form of Inxialot, the king of the liches and representative of the undead. Stop interfering with your antics, Inxialot. This is a matter that concerns the entire council, not just two races. She looked like a woman in her late fifties, but she had lived for over five centuries. Her long black hair had partially turned into a silvery white color and was held up in a chignon. Your f right stories on slash o slash v l b n c m. She had delicate features, but neither her expression or her voice had any warmth. Her eyes were burning with mana, looking at Inxialot in a way that closely reminded Lith of Minohur and the Queen. She was barely 1.6 meters, 5 feet 3 inches, tall, and had a frame thin enough that a casual onlooker would have been worried that a sudden gust of wind might blow her away. Yet from their previous encounter, Lith knew she had a vitality superior to that of Scarlet the Scorpicor and a bright violet mana core. If he dies, the session ends, correct? Which means I can go back home. Inxialot's logic was as flawless as it was insane. Inxialot Nagar looked like a sloppily mummified corpse, with barely enough tissues and muscles left to express how annoyed he was. He wore a tattered red silk robe with gold embroideries whose holes were masterfully patched by thick cobwebs. The spiders that were his tenants were pissed off from all that nonsense as well. Usually, a marble statue was a globetrotter compared to the lich. No matter how much the undead press on the matter, Awaken Verhen is not going to die today. Raga roared, and the rest of the council nodded. The undead want him to die? Inxialot was flabbergasted. Bunch of hypocrites. If they wanted to save me this hassle, they could have picked someone else as their representative. Only then did Ragu understand, and with her the rest of the council, that Inxialot had no idea nor care for what his faction wanted. He was there solely to represent himself. Many face bombs ensued on both the judges' stand and among the spectators. Only Ligain was laughing his ass off. And that's why so few among us awakened decide to turn into undead. Faluel was in her human form and was as lovely as always. With time and isolation, it's never a matter of if one becomes mad, only of when. Some people are born that way. Lith replied, finally understanding what was the weight that had burdened him ever since he wore the shackles. Every single person in the room possessed such a powerful mana flow that, even though they weren't even trying to harm Lith, it threatened to crush him now that his own aura had been suppressed. Now I understand why untrained people tend to be scared shitless by mages. I would probably have the same effect on people if not for Solus's help restraining my mana flow. On top of that, if not for Faluel shielding me, I wouldn't even be able to stand. Lith thought. The Hydra had remained close to him the whole time, wrapping Lith with her aura to ease the pressure he had to endure. Chapter 990 Miracles and Madness Part 2 From Faluel's pockets, Solus would have been drenched in a cold sweat if not for her total lack of glands. Her mana sense allowed Solus to realize what kind of monsters surrounded them whereas Lith remained calm due to his blissful ignorance. Let's put it this way. The more you interfere with the trial, the more time will waste. Ligain said. The Guardian had the appearance of a lean albino man, one, 75 meters, 5 feet 9 inches, tall, with snow-white hair and skin. His eyes were purple and had a vertical pupil. The father of all dragons wore a full black war armor that only left exposed his face and hands. Multiple spots of his skin were halfway turned into scales, making Ligain look like he had tattoos. At those words, Inxialot sat straight, 
and shut his mouth. The entire council admired once again the ability of the guardian to perform miracles. Archmage Verhen, you've been brought in front of this tribunal to decide whether you'll be forbidden from having an awakened master and banned from the council, like the undead demand dash. Ligain looked at Inxialot, whose mouth was agape while mouthing a really, yet no sound came out. Or you'll finally become an integral member of our society. In the case the latter happens, we'll rule about who is more fit to fix your troublemaking character. You have piqued the interest of the beasts and the humans, so we'll give both parties the chance to present their arguments. First, we'll hear from the undead. Everyone turned toward Inxialot, who looked at them as if they were raving mad. It took him a few seconds to remember why he was there and rummage through his notes to find what he needed. Remember to water the plants, buy food for your pet. Nope, this is the grocery list. Inxialot said, Another damn council meeting. Today Raga looks hot as usual. I should make a move within the century. Nope, this is my diary. Everyone went pale at those words, Rago included. Here it is. Dear fellow council members, the accused awakened Verhen has broken several of our customs during the years, and that was tolerable as long as he was just a rogue stranded among humans. Yet, even after learning about our society, even after meeting several members of our kin, he never bothered learning our customs or worried about our endless struggle to keep fake mages from learning our secrets. During his short 20 years of age, he has shared the secret of awakening with more people than most of our centuries-old members do, putting both us and himself at the whims of fate. Awaken Verhen has also traded an Orichalcum armor with fake mages, obtaining nothing for it but a fancy title and allowing them to come one step closer to true forge mastery. For those reasons and because of how shady his past is, it's our conviction that he should be banned from our kin and left to fend for himself. Inxialot read the paper with a monotonous voice, without putting any effort to sound convincing. It was clear that someone had written the speech for him, yet it didn't make his arguments any less true. If the proposal passed, Lith would have been forced to go back to the kingdom or risk facing Dawn's wrath on his own. I can see from your file that you have awakened for magical beasts, your own sister, and that you plan on awakening more. Is it true? Lotho the Treant, the plant representative of the council, asked. He looked like a giant oak tree come to life. Even while sitting, his treetop brushed the high ceiling of the courtroom and squirrels could be seen running up and down his massive body. If not for his huge amber eyes and the massive tree trunks that Lith assumed were Lotho's limbs only, because they came out of his body at the shoulder and hip level, the awakened was no different from a regular tree. Even if it is true, how is that a violation of the rules? Lith stood up to not be forced to look up to his accusers. None of those I awakened shared our secrets, nor did they draw any attention to themselves. It doesn't matter how many people I awaken as long as I instruct them properly. The reason you're losing ground against fake mages is that they work together whereas, despite your long lives, you have more factions than members. You should be grateful to me for bringing talented people into our fold. Well said. Inxialot gave him a standing ovation, clapping his bony hands and making the undead in the public wish they could kill him. How do you answer about the matter of the Orichalcum armor? Fila the behemoth, the beast representative sat back and steepled her fingers. Her original nature was that of an emperor beast, so her human form was shaped according to how she imagined herself to be. Fila looked like a woman in her late thirties, but... She was actually 453 years old. Her waist-long chestnut hair had streaks of silver, black, and orange all over, forming a multicolored tress that reached the small of her back. She had had an oval face with delicate features, yet her bearing was that of a battle-hardened general. Fila was 1.9 meters, 6 feet 3 inches, tall and had a muscular yet curvy figure that seasoned warriors and women alike envied her. 
It's true that the kingdom didn't fulfill their promise completely, but the Archmage title comes with many benefits, included the knowledge I needed to improve my skills. Lith couldn't tell them about war without putting Orion and the Urnas at risk. This over padatat novels on N O Lomitko a Lomitko Lubin. Co. He knew that a few members of the council were helping his enemies from behind the scene, and Floria's family was his most powerful backer. More importantly, they were his loyal friends. Selling them to please a bunch of old farts he had never met was beyond outrageous to Lith. I simply assumed that being my crafting process extremely complicated, they would fail to learn anything from it. Moreover, this incident is more your fault than mine. If young and masterless awakened like me received from the council the means to further their research, even the basics, we wouldn't be forced to rely on fake mages. You dare criticize my choice, but... If not for the kingdom and his mages, my talent would be still rotting in Lusha. Do you think that I've slain so many awakened due to dumb luck or miracle encounters? It was all thanks to my hard work and the good deals I made with fake mages. That's how I disposed of the previous human lord of the Distar region and his goons. Lith was referring to Garen Rogias, the over 300 years old awakened who had died at his hands, allowing the Thung to take both his territory and place in the council. Many murmurs followed Litha's words. Some reproached his hubris. Most approved his results. Awaken Verhen is right. Jiza stood up from the defendant's stand. Like Faluol, she had never left his side, yet unlike her, Jiza wasn't doing anything to protect Lith from the ocean of mana that threatened to swallow his mind. I've seen him fighting, studied his armor, and witnessed the prowess of his equipment. His skinwalker armor is strong beyond his core. The blade he used is unlike any I've ever seen before, and he managed to craft a cloaking device that also serves as dimensional storage. <laughs>